I never expected to be captured. We, that never entered our minds. And they lined us up in front of a, an embankment, and this German corporal picked up his gun, went around, set it on the ground, and laid down behind it and cocked it. And about that time, I thought, holy cow, what's going to happen here? It was the last thing that I expected would happen to me. I was really stunned. I had thought of being killed, wounded. The problem was one of surprise. Here I was with a carbine in my hand, and over facing me a little ways was a man with a German Schmeiser submachine gun. That's not a very good match. I realized that I was a survivor, and that most of the guys, the heroes, are buried over there. We had a certain amount of shame for being captured. We didn't tell our stories for a long time after getting home. I just tapped one guy on the shoulder and said, uh, can you speak English? And he said, yes, of course. Well, they said, for you, the war is over. My friends, fellow countrymen, I am glad of this opportunity to speak a few words to you, though it must from necessity be from the confines of the prison land. It will be of interest to you, however, to be reassured that regardless of personal times, we are far from being downhearted, and the morale is good. The sun comes out. Our armored vehicles move toward the forward positions. The road to off Flag 64 began in North Africa as U.S. troops arrived in November of 1942. Captain Irving Yarrick was on the initial landing. On December 23rd, his battalion's mission was to replace the British, who were on Long Stop Hill, just north of Mejez El Bab. And they said there was nobody coming off the hill because they all had been killed. The next thing I knew, down comes company-sized unit. What we didn't know was that the Germans followed them. And there were a lot of caves on the hill and we just walked into a trap. Two months after Yarrick's capture, Rommel's Africa Corps inflicted a large land defeat on the American forces at Fayed and Kasserine Pass. It was during this attack that General Patton's son-in-law, Lieutenant Colonel John Waters, would be captured. More than 5,000 American soldiers were listed as casualties, killed, wounded, or captured. I had, uh, I and another officer had gone out to try to rescue one of our officers that we heard had been wounded on the front lines, who was a member of our regimental staff. We got out to where he was and found him already dead. And so I sent the other officer back and I went obliquely forward to where I knew we had a company of uh, our regiment. But that had already been overrun and I just walked into an ambush and that's how I was captured. I, I don't really think that I thought they were gonna kill me. It took me down to, uh, I ended up the first, the second night in Sfax on the coast of Tunisia, Mediterranean coast. And it was a POW cage and uh, I slept on the ground there that night and I woke up the next morning. My reaction was, what have I done? What have I done? The captured Americans were taken to Tunis, Tunisia's capital, then flown via German aircraft to Italy. As families awaited the status of their loved ones, these young American soldiers began their new battle in the war, behind the barbed wire. American officers and enlisted men captured in the North African campaign were separated and imprisoned at camps in Italy and Germany. The officers would meet British POWs who had been captive since much earlier in the war. And from them, they would learn their prison smarts and their new name, Kriegis, slang for Kriegsgefangenen, 
meaning prisoners of war. In early June, the Third Reich began moving the American combat officers to their own compound, located deep into Poland in the village of Schuben, renamed by the Germans as Altburgund. French and British Air Force officers had been held there since 1940, but they would be moved, and on June 6, 1943, the name of the 10-acre Polish school would be changed to Offlag 64. The first 35 officers arrived at the Schuben Rail Station, followed several days later by over 100 more men. Senior American officer Colonel Thomas Drake, with several lieutenant colonels, including Patton's son-in-law, John Waters, would assume the leadership roles at Offlag 64. There was some letdown in morale, in appearance. People weren't shaving and so on. And Colonel Drake straightened that out. After one of our roll calls, our appels kept us in formation, and he said, in effect, and boiling it down, he said, if you guys are close enough to the enemy to get captured, you're close enough to get killed. So kind of quit complaining. You're lucky to be alive. And he had a demeanor and an appearance, a stance, which could be to the Germans one to respect. I was room commander of 40 officers, and one morning, one of, the, one of my buddies called my attention to the fact that the dog had def defecated on the floor, and he was going to clean it up, and I said, no, I'll get Colonel Drake. So I went down to Colonel Drake, and I said, I'd like to show you something, Colonel, and brought him up to show him the dog dirt, and Drake was very indignant, just as I was, so he called for the, the German colonel, and he said, I never want to see those dogs in this camp again, ever, unless you tolerate it in your officers' camps, and that we never saw them again. We needed two things, self-respect and discipline, and he was very keen on that. And I don't mean uh, up two, three, four discipline, I mean uh, discipline, and uh, Walters, and Alger, and not they alone, other of those uh, lieutenant colonel infantry, mostly our armor, uh, I think were very good in keeping the morale good and keeping the sense of discipline. Setting up quarters inside the 10-acre compound was an early priority. This building's name would be coined the White House for good reason. It was here that the American staff officers set up headquarters. The first two floors were used as living quarters for the early Kriegies. A small library was set up on the third floor, and it was here that several officers operated a small radio given to them by the British POWs and smuggled into camp. A hospital was set up in this large building. Major medical conditions, though, had to be treated at nearby Gneisen. As the early months passed, activities were organized to help occupy the mines and preserve the sanity of the men. In August of 43, a visit by a Swede proved to be a blessing for the American officers, who found a Father Christmas in Henry Soderberg. The International Red Cross and the International YMCA traveled freely in German-occupied territories during World War II. POW camps, including Offlag 64 in Schuben, Poland, received clothing and food parcels from the Red Cross, who by war's end had sent massive amounts of provisions to some two million Allied prisoners of war in Europe. These parcels were vital to the survival of officers due to the meager German rations. The YMCA also visited World War II prison camps, forming a group called Help the Victims of the War. Well, Colonel Drake and the other people, including Waters, insisted that we all exercise. So Henry Soderberg, the YMCA representative from Sweden, came in and asked what we wanted and then put the word out and the American government sent the stuff to Sweden and they sent the stuff in. And so he came in with volleyball, with volleyballs and soccer balls and bats and balls and books and musical instruments and just about anything to keep you going. Soderbergh became the welcome suite to the men of Offlag 64, his first visit, August 16, 1943. 
Noting the number of American officers to be some 250, he wrote in his journal, the German commandant, Oberst Schneider, points out immediately that Waters is the son-in-law of General Patton. I find that John Waters and the officers whom I met today are very fine representatives of the United States. I am meeting a new kind of camp and different type of prisoners of war. I quickly find out that there is a very, very firm determination among the Americans to do the best out of captivity. He visited the camp several times through 1943 and 1944. been there just a few months and uh, Miller Creek and I decided we would make an effort to put out or try to put out a little monthly paper that there, there was enough going on in the camp and that we might be able to work in a little humor and a little lightness and maybe something that would help morale. So we, uh, we talked to our commanding officer. He thought it might be a good idea if the Germans would agree to it, but he didn't think that they would, and we checked with the Germans. And much to our surprise, they not only agreed, but they agreed to print it, to have it printed. One of our guards had a printing press in town, German guard. What, what else he did with it, I don't know. But he had uh, the type, hand setting and all that. One of the fellows went down to get his parcel. You know, when he took it back to the barracks and opened it up, there were kittens in there. A cat had had kittens in his. You know, they kept the parcel open to for the Germans to examine it while it was sitting out on the counter open. When his cat produced a litter in there, and uh, the guy took it back. That was my uh, cartoon of that because it was it was a funny event. February's issue reported some sad news. Captain Richard Torrance Jr. had died from a heart attack while standing at a pell in January. A service was given at the camp's chapel, led by Father Stanley Brock, a Catholic priest captured in North Africa. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost descend upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Most news, though, uplifted the spirits of the Kriegies. The latest in All Flag 64 sports, humorous notes like this classified. Wanted, a machine capable of taking off from a small confined space and traveling 4,000 miles without refueling. I am the eternal optimist, and I know how valuable humor is. It's a very valuable commodity, and it certainly was a valuable commodity in that camp. The Army came out at the end of the war with a retrospect on the thing, and it gave great credit to this little monthly paper. We had 15 issues of it, to uh, lifting morale. I don't know whether there's any truth to this or not, but, but they thought it made, it made a difference to, to give a feel of uh, cohesiveness and, and college-type feeling of, of uh, people who enjoyed each other's company. There came a time when the senior officers in the camp called a group of us together. There was about 15 uh, guys, uh, and we called ourselves the uh, theater group. And our mission was to prepare the, a program of entertainment for the camp. A year ago, June 6th, we arrived at Off Flag 64 with a trumpet, a guitar, and an accordion. We had purchased these three instruments as we passed through other camps on our way here. Let's call Yashi up in Paris on Larry's phone. Can you picture Larry's face when he gets the bill? A farewell rib. That was a very uh, useful thing, not only to those of us who were involved in it, but those who uh, saw the shows, heard the concerts, did the things. It was uh, something to look forward to, something to uh, have them escape uh, the realities of uh, prison life. The point was to make it all be as much like home as you could. The number of American ground force officers held captive of the Third Reich in Schuben, Poland continued to grow into 1944. 
Keeping fit and busy inside off Flag 64 were mandates of the senior American officer, Colonel Thomas Drake, who commanded strict discipline from his men. He wrote in their published off Flag item, whether we surrender to the role of a has-been, a down-and-outer, or develop and maintain character that will stand us in good stead all of our lives depends upon the individual and the attitude of his comrades. For the men who referred to themselves as Kriegies, there was no better source of morale boost than writing to and receiving from family at home. Colonel Waters logged each letter and package he received at camp. He also kept track of the many letters he wrote to his wife, B. Patton. Dearest B, how can I ever send you my thanks for those darling pictures of the boys? They are easily and without a doubt the best I've ever seen. Another letter reads, Pat will soon be four, and how often I wonder what goes on in his little mind regarding his father. With you there, I know he is happy and carefree, and that you make it seem right that his father is not present. However, it is not natural for children to grow up without their parents. Waters wrote of camp news, continually thanked his wife for the packages and sent his love to her and the children. He, like most Kriegies, relied heavily on letters, and the inefficient delivery of them affected morale tremendously. I just believed I was about to have a sad weekend when the mailman brought me four letters from you, three from your ma and three others. I can't thank you all enough. When one stations himself daily at the door to meet the mailman and then doesn't receive a single letter for several weeks, it's a great occasion when 10 arrive. American and German officials censored incoming and outgoing mail with black ink. However, what the German censors didn't detect was that in certain simple greetings to home, there was classified information hidden between the lines. We had a, a group, in, including General Waters and a couple others, who were actually operating like a G2 in the service. We'd have little meetings and they would talk about it and they'd say, we need to get this back. So there were several of us in this letter writing business. And of course, in the writing, most all of my letters, of course, went to my wife. And they were intercepted and decoded before she ever got them. And of course, it was all in the code, which I won't disclose now because we might want to use it again. Secret packages, too, were smuggled into camp. Royal Lee worked in the parcel store. No, the Germans would take us in by a horse and wagon or a truck, you know. And we'd have a couple of guards in there, and then we'd take the packages off. Captain Dix, who was the head of our particular group, knew that there would be packages coming in with false names or names of people that weren't in the camp. And we would take these packages off and read the name, and he would write them down. But when we would come to one of these names, you didn't write it down. But they were stacked in with the rest of the packages, and then when we got back into camp, why, those things were shuttled off to one side and hid. One package skirted by the German guards contained a bird. It would replace the one brought in by the early Kriegies in June of 43. Housed on the third floor of the White House, what was coined the bird was actually a radio that kept off Flag 64 abreast of the world at war. Second radio came in the mail. Eamon Carter was in the mail room. And he, we knew what package it was in. So he was able to uh, uh, get it out before the Germans knew about it. You know, in those days, you had radio tubes. Each tube was about the size of an electric bulb. And uh, those had to be either smuggled in or uh, given, uh, brought in by a guard. And the, the guards could be bribed uh, to, and that's how they got some of the tubes, I, I know, by bribing the guards. And they bribed the guards with coffee and cigarettes, because that's that's what those fellas didn't get, and that's what they craved. We'd dispatch ourselves quietly like it was a visit to see a friend or whatever to disguise the uh, appearance of coming there regularly or a routine, which they would have picked up easily. And when he would start to read it, they'd all 
I would stand by the door or somebody else would stand by the door and then there was one up by the hospital and all that. If they saw any of the goons, as we called them, coming through the gate, they tipped us off so that the they couldn't hear us reading or anything like that. The bird was never discovered by the enemy. Escape was also on the minds of the American officers. With an escape committee, ideas for fleeing the 10-acre compound could be controlled as not to jeopardize the lives of the whole. One plan to escape included a tunnel. These were supposedly uh, escape-proof barracks, but there was one section in the uh, washroom where they had a cement block going right down to the ground. We took the, the tub out, made a false bottom to that block, dug right through the, hole, through the block, and went down almost 20 feet. There had to be a place to hide the soil. And so they developed these long tubes that fit down in the trousers with a little string attachment at the base that came up through the belt. And as they would walk around through the garden, they would pull that loose and the soil would fall into the garden and then be uh, distributed by foot. But that wasn't a very efficient way to do it. And eventually they put them in the top of one of the buildings. You could get up to the, up to the little false attic there at the entrance to our compound. And you could go up there, and then uh, they'd pass them down. They'd have four or five people, and they'd get past them down. They just kept stacking them along there till they really stacked them. Oftentimes, uh, you take uh, 12 slats in a bed, long six-foot bed, and you may have maybe three, four, five, something like that, because the rest were going underground for support of the tunneling. As they got down a distance, of course, they started to pass out and the normal sink has an air vent in it. We tapped into that pipe, and nobody had better use <laughs> that washer, the washstand either. Tapped into that pipe, and uh, had a little room down at the beginning of the tunnel, and the fellow would sit there and turn this thing and run air out to the end where they were digging. Yeah. The air funneled through cans that had been cut and fitted tightly within each other. The Germans suspected tunnel digging, even used dynamite several times in search. After all, they had learned of these tunnels from other camps. In March of 1944, British POWs held in Stalag Luft III in Zagen, Germany, would attempt what would become known as the Great Escape. Fifty men who made it out of the tunnel were murdered by the Gestapo, even though the Geneva Code of 1928 forbade the killing of a prisoner of war if he were to escape. The digging at Offlag 64 was eventually stopped, not from the guards finding it, but from the senior American command deciding it was too risky. In the summer of 43, Lieutenants Roy Chappell, Frank Ayton, and William Higgins found a perfect area along the east side of camp where summer foliage blocked the view from the guard tower. They would secure wire cutters through barter with a Polish worker and proceed to cut a hole in what was then barbed wire fencing. I've always laughed about that because when I was cutting it, I was holding it tight, you know, and snipping it. I thought you could hear the damn thing twang all the way back to Paris, France. Of course, you couldn't, but in my mind, you could. And I had some careful watchers. That's about as much as they wanted to be with a watcher <laughs> back in the shadows of the big house. The biggest challenge was to walk down the sidewalk near the commandant's house, down the street, and then the cemetery entrance. Chapel made it to the cemetery, followed by Higgins, then Aiton. Just before Aiton entered, an off-duty guard spotted him. The escape was over. The sentence, solitary confinement. While in solitary in the summer of 43 at Offlag 64, Lieutenants Chapel, Higgins, and Ayton devised a plan for their next escape. There was a window with bars at the south end of the block. Behind it, a large drainage ditch. They'd make keys to the locks, smuggle in a hacksaw, and free themselves through the window. The three, plus Colonel John Van Fleet and Lieutenant Richard Secor, were ready to enact their second escape in May of 1944. What they lacked was a way to get thrown into solitary where their escape route awaited. Someone suggested they act drunk, 
And so, late one night, they took fermented raisins they'd brewed up and put the concoction all over themselves. The party began. Oh, yelling, raising hell of all kinds and acting drunk. And finally, I saw some uh, garbage cans nearby. And they were metal garbage cans. So I took the cart we were banging around the courtyard with and crashed it in to the garbage can. Well, that gave him sufficient case of the red ash. You know, he said, all right, enough is enough is enough already yet. And then he uh, opened the gate, took us across to the barracks over there. Now, we had taped the hacksaw to the bottom of Secor's feet. They were giving a thorough search. As they came to Dick and began to search him, he, uh, he uh, self-energized a huge pile of vomit, and he managed to throw the vomit on the German guard, which met with very, very poor reception. And so they were so mad then, they just uh, quit searching Secor. Vomit was on him, too, of course, but I thought it was such a brilliant thing, and then took us on back and threw us in the cell. They were sentenced to only nine days in solitary by Oberst Schneider, the camp commandant. They would have to saw the bars quickly and not get caught. The afternoon before the final sentence was, would have been served, we got, were ready to break out. And uh, we did. And Higgins and Aiden, being the two smallest, went first and hit the ground and just really got on up there. Then the other team was supposed to be Secor and Chapel and Colonel Van Vliet. And he passed the key, bent wire, back under it to me, and I couldn't open it from the outside. So why, I don't know. So Secor and I at that time were very reluctantly gonna have to leave Colonel Van Vliet, which we did. We got out and hit the ground. But we weren't 300 yards up the ditch. When the furor broke out, the dogs and the guards came chasing down the and we hit the ground in a, a planted field, and we went back in, and here they began to become diligent. Chapel and his fellow escape artists were thrown back into solitary, this time with no shoes, no pants, and a guard to watch them 24 hours a day. They remained in solitary until August of 44 taken to trial in nearby Ganesan with their own lawyers, fellow prisoners who were attorneys back home. They were charged with destruction of property of the Third Reich, the cutting of the bars. The sentence? Six more weeks of solitary confinement. That's been one of the big jokes on me, as I used to think I knew everybody in the camp, and I saw them when they came in and all that. And then someone pointed out to me, Chapel, how many people did you meet when you were in solitary? And I shut up, tucked my tail between my legs, and waddled back over to the dumbass corner because <laughs> when I realized I had told up about 100 days overall in solitary, you know me to help a lot of people <laughs> when you're sitting in a solitary cell playing Battleship, whoever else is in there with you. That, that was a very good activity, was to play Battleship. I can hear it right now. A-10. Wham, you son of a bitch, you hit my battleship right in the middle of it, you know, coming down through the corridor. With Chapel's second escape sending him back in solitary directly after the attempt in May, he and the other men would miss a very special celebration at Off Lag 64 in June of 1944, an anniversary party. Someone got the brilliant idea, let's celebrate our first year as POWs at Off Lag 64, which would fall on June 6th. We did it on June 5th, on the, on the, the eve, it was a, a show, and the, we had placards made, and you stood in the proper line across the front and held the cards out, and it spelled, Let's Go Ike. And of course, the next morning was, you know, D-Day. And we didn't know that. First of all, our band played uh, an early morning uh, concert or whatever it was, and then we were going to have the roll call. The Germans came in, and they rushed back out again. We didn't know what was happening. 
And then Colonel Drake got the information that the landing in Normandy has started. They came into my room, our room, there were four of us, two Gestapo agents, and my brother-in-law had sent me a box of cigars. Now, why he did that, I don't know. He knew I didn't smoke, but he was wise enough. He had come from the Middle East to realize that maybe this was good barter. So I opened up that box, and I handed them a couple of cigars. At first, they refused, and I insisted. So they each took it, but they took the little ring off and then stuck in their pocket, and then they left. They never touched a thing in our room. 30 minutes after the Pathfinders take off, the first serials of C-47s follow on the invasion path. Faced with a very serious condition because the young C-47 Maguni pilots, transport planes, had never been in, had never even had a piece of flak thrown at them. And it broke loose across that Normandy Peninsula like you've never seen in your life. And they did the very thing they were warned to get, not to do, evasive action. It upsets the jumpers in the back end, it loses their bearings, it uh, loses the pilot's bearings, and soon you're trying to dodge every flak puff that you see out there. And you just don't get on the drop zone, or the DZ as it's called. Stand the door. Ready with the green. Show the green. Go! They gave us the green light, which means let's go. And we jumped. And I broke my ankle or my tibia in my foot, my left foot, on the jump. They had told us uh, because of Sicily, where they dumped, where they tried a parachute operation and the our own Navy shot down the men, shot down our planes. They dumped people in the ocean and uh, scattered people all over the island so they weren't affected. They promised us they were going to put us right on target. And uh, it, it, I realized uh, in my own experience that was true, but also uh, while I was a pre OW, that was, I was suffering because of that debacle. My platoon probably suffered uh, as much as any. There were only six men left of my 30 men that went back to England. The commentator says, many of the men in this long line of prisoners on their way to prison camps are happy to have escaped death. They tried to make a, the American soldier. We looked pretty decrepit as it was, not being uh, hungry and scared and, and uh, unshaven and unclean. And they pointed at us as if the American soldat and trying to discredit the American army man as uh, much as they could. After D-Day, off-lag 64's population would grow rapidly as the enemy continued to capture and send American ground force officers to Shuba. That was just, it was just wonderful to be a, be in a place where you felt secure with, and it was run like, like, the, like the army. You were back in the army again. The first fellow I saw was a fellow I went to high school with, Tom Miller. Many oh, of the old prisoners came in to greet us, speak to us, find out where we were from or what units. And we didn't realize that what they were doing was trying to establish the fact that we were not plants, we were not German. Uh, that we, we were Americans, and of course everybody had gone through OCS, and so they could ask questions about OCS, ask about um, football or baseball or something of that sort, or they, you'd find somebody that's from your community or your area that would be able to question you about people that you knew. As captured American officers flooded into Offlag 64 into the fall, the treatment by the Germans began to worsen, with more influence directed from the Gestapo. Evidence came during one morning's appell that turned into several hours of standing. The guards went through barracks and confiscated clothing to be worn as disguise by the German army. 
I was able to get two GI shirts and uh, that I wore and uh, on top of the ones that I had. And uh, so when I got back to the barracks then, I made this uh, hood with a go down my neck, make a scarf and a fit over the face, so they, over my nose, so that the, the snow and the rain, uh, or snow, <laughs> snow and the, and the cold, and then it buttoned over here. I sewed the buttons on. I, I see a couple of moth holes here. But uh, I pieced that together, and I, I marvel at my own <laughs> ingenuity because <laughs> I'm not a sewer, but uh, it worked out great. I had a wool knit cap underneath this. Uh, gee, I, Will knit cap and it really was warm. In October, 52 year old Colonel Paul Good would arrive at Off Flag 64, replacing Colonel Thomas Drake, who was repatriated due to stomach ulcers. Pop Good would carry on the military discipline set forth by Drake and his staff. Frank Diggs and his staff worked diligently on their daily bulletin a collection of translations from German newspapers and daily radio broadcasts by the German High Command. Great interest was paid to the Russian offensive building up and heading toward Shubin itself. Many officers continued their readings and taking classes at Shubin College. We had 5,000 uh, volumes of fiction, uh, poetry, uh, science, most everything, including some of the scientific areas. And so you had a wise choice, a very wide choice that you could work with. But I got the equivalent, I say, in a resume, of about 18 months of law at Shubin College. I enrolled in a class in German, and I enrolled in a class in uh, horticulture. And I thought if you could learn to prune from a book, I thought I knew all there was to know about pruning because they had a good book on how to prune. I, I kick myself for not getting into the language classes and, and, and learning German. You know, what a beautiful opportunity, but I didn't. Spanish instead. Why, I don't know, you know. <laughs> but I think if it had lasted another five years, we'd have had, we'd had a, a credit. <laughs> we'd had graduation, people graduating from, from the Creaky College. But uh, it, was, it was wonderful to have something like that to get, keep your mind off of things. And that was what you did. You looked worked all, it looked all the time for something to, to do. From October to December 3rd, the Red Cross number 10 parcels never made it into off flag 64. Mail was delayed. Hauptmann Zimmermann, the German security officer, stated that the delay was from train lines being shot out by the Americans. Several months later, it was discovered that these vital food parcels were deliberately being withheld outside the camp. Lieutenant Colonel John Waters wrote to his wife, B. Patton, the food situation has taken on a rosy hue. Right now, they're unloading 2,000 number 10 Red Cross parcels, enough for two weeks. You must get bored with all my talk about food and mail, but they, along with warmth, are our three daily problems, and therefore, foremost on our minds. Well, you kept busy. That's why we had the plays, that's why we had the musical instruments, that's why we had the athletics, that's why we did the walking. Because you didn't, you didn't spend a lot of time eating, I'll tell you. I think the lack of food and always thinking about, <laughs> about food, uh, you never seem to have enough. We would get Red Cross parcels and the, they had a kitchen detail that would take uh, meat and whatever meat and stuff was in it, spam and corned beef, I guess, and uh, put it all together and make, make something out of it. The Red Cross, through the British, sent us seeds. The Royal Horticultural Society of England sent us seeds of vegetables of various kinds. I sent home for rutabaga, which I'd never heard of. My father had never heard of it when he got the letter. He had to go finding out what a rutabaga was. It was very hard to get used to the German bread. Once we got used to it, it was, it was very good for us. Because you've got to figure, we were on 500 calories a day. I, started, I was captured at 172 and went to 119 in six weeks and stayed that way for the rest of the time. They had saved food back for weeks and weeks and weeks, and Red, parts of Red Cross parcels too, for the Christmas dinner. 
And the funniest thing was to me was the table that I was sent to, and we were split up and scattered so we would meet people. But these were, my table were mostly majors, and captains of majors, and one lieutenant colonel. And I didn't know what to expect, but the first thing that they did was uh, they had a loaf of bread, and they, one man sliced it very carefully. He spent a lot of time slicing it. And then the next man to his left had the, had the privilege of choosing the first slice of bread. And of course, he chose the biggest one. And it went around the table. And the fellow that did the cutting was the last, he got the last piece. So unless he did a good job of cutting, that he got much less than the other. And this was a ritual. They spent several minutes studying the, the, the pieces of bread. The cheese, you know, that uh, was so rotten and full of maggots that the cooks wouldn't try to serve it to us. They put it out. Maybe it was Limburger, and that, because that smells bad anyway. But anyway, it was so rotten that they set it out back of the door and passed word along that anybody that wanted to come could have all the cheese that they wanted out there. Well, there were very few of us, and they got close to it and could smell it. They took any of that cheese, but I was that hungry that I went up and cut off a slice. It might have been a pound or a pound and a half, two pounds, and it was full of maggots. I took it back to the barracks, uh, tried to get all the maggots out of it, sliced it as thin as I could, and I can't remember what I put it on, something that was, that, where I could get it back, salvage it, and uh, put it back together then after it got almost dry. And I put it up in the top of my locker or the top of my storage bin, and I would cut a little piece of it off once, if, when I wanted to reward, my, reward myself for something, it, uh, it, it, uh, it tasted better than any candy that I've ever had. And uh, I, I just th think about I, how impossible I, it would have been for me to eat anything approaching that uh, and then to have to, tend to eat it and s consider it an absolute delicacy because we were so hungry. In late summer, several American officers, including Jack Rathbone, Seymour Bolton, and George Durgan, were en route to the Shubin train station for medical attention nearby. They were forbidden to walk on the sidewalk. In protest, they did. They were brought to trial, acquitted, then scheduled to be retried by the direct order of Hitler in late January, this time the death sentence. Another trial ensued after a confrontation in September over the posting of a sign by the Gestapo, a sign that would result in the escape committee's decision to halt construction of the tunnel. It warned that escaping from prison camps has ceased to be a sport. Escaping prisoner of war entering such death zones will certainly lose their lives. Lieutenant James Schmitz stood in the door protesting the sign as it was hung by two German guards. He and a senior command officer, Lieutenant Colonel Schaefer, were tried for interfering with the functions of the Third Reich and found guilty, sentenced to death. Schaefer would be transferred to a high-security prison at Kolditz Castle in Saxony. Schmitz returned to Schubin. With the Russian troops advancing and the Allied forces moving forward in Europe, none of the death sentences would ever be carried out. Russian troops were driving across Poland on their way to Berlin, and Schubin was on their route. Would the Russian army realize that off Flag 64 was a prison camp for Americans and liberate them? Or might they mistake them for Germans and shoot? On a bitter cold January 20th, 1945, 20 below, artillery fire could be heard in the distance. American officers watched German and Polish families on foot and wagon heading westward down Adolf Hitler's Strasse. Russian forces were within 75 miles. German high command ordered the prisoners of war to pack and stand ready to march out the following morning. We, of course, tried to carry almost everything except the kitchen sink with us. We had, from Italy, we had a, a large blanket, wool blanket, which was quite warm, and it was, uh, must have been six or seven feet long. And we rolled that up, and uh, 
with cans of food that we had. I had nothing to pack up. <laughs> I had uh, one pair of socks. Uh, YMCA or somebody had sent in this, uh, these little wooden suitcases. And, uh, I took a couple of bed slats and nailed it to the, uh, to the sides to make runners for a sled. And we got all the cigarettes and chocolate and all that we could go for trading purposes. I loved libraries and loved books, and so I went over and got uh, full pap paperbacks and uh, good, good books, and also a huge book of the complete uh, works of Byron, Keats, and Shelley. Most stupid thing I ever did, because the book weighed about three or four pounds. Two inches of fresh snow on the ground, American officers awoke. 10.30 a.m., the gates opened, and over 1,400 Americans marched out, leaving 90 of their comrades. With several men hiding in the tunnel and men too sick to march waving from the window, it was farewell to the barbed wire of off-lank 64. Several miles in, the heavy loads were being shed. George Jaskalian remembers a large book dropping to the ground. And as it landed in the snow, face upright, as I reached uh, opposite it, I read the name of the book, Mein Kampf. And as I read it, one of the guards who was abreast of me stomped on it with his hobnailed boots. And I said, this is a signal of the eminent, imminent demise of the Third Reich. What started out as an organized march soon spread out several miles. The icy and cold conditions and a crowded road of men, women, and children all heading in the same direction. Before a young man to see this and be involved in it, uh, seemed to be uh, so far removed from our life. Frozen bodies, we saw. We were better off than anybody on the road. Wszystkich ludzi, żeby te noclegi przygotować i rozlokować ich po tych budynkach. And then his father arranged for place to stay for these soldiers. And uh, biggest part from this 1,500 people group uh, stayed in the barn for overnight. And another quite good, quite big group as well stayed in the house. Stanislaw Mankowski was 12 years old and lived on this dairy farm outside of Exxon. The baron who occupied this farm had fled westward several days earlier. The first day's march, 25 kilometers. I can remember they're rousting us up while it was still dark. And they were scared. They were really scared. They were rushing, rouse, rouse, rouse. This voice is, is saying, Johnny, let's leave now. The guards aren't organized, or words to that effect. The reply from Waters is, no, Lou, I'm going to stay with Pop Good. He needs me. The uh, second floor of this barn was full of uh, hay bales. And uh, I went back and told my friends that we had a chance to escape because uh, the Germans were, were so afraid. The majority filed out under the lead of Colonel Paul Pop Good, who carried bagpipes with him containing the secret radio. Many of the Americans, however, hid with plans to remain. Being the main German speaker and the main gut jerk, I was the one who went out to the three German soldiers left behind, Corporal, EFC, and a private. And they were left behind by Ober Schneider to bring the straggling Americans on up and catch the column. So that's when I did my little deal. I don't want to repeat this thing, but it uh, seemed like exactly the right thing. Then I went out to them and told them in German in a nice way. I said, now, you realize that the Russians are killing all Germans on site, civilian or soldiers. And when they get here, 
I don't know if we can protect you from them or not. And the corporal, being brighter than the other two, thought a minute and said, I think I better go get some help from the column. And off he went. PFC, being next to intelligence, thought about what the corporal had done and thought he'd better go catch the corporal and help him. And, of course, the private uh, quickly seized the situation, and he, too, left. And then we set about kind of organizing our little group there in that house at Vegheim. We put up a sign on the outside. Uh, uh, Mouse and I made it. Amerikonsky of Itzerov, which is in Russian, correct Russian, American officers, set it outside. And uh, by mid-afternoon, the advancing Russians came through. Mankovsky watched the first Russian tanks arrive at the farm's gate. Tanks turned and aimed fire at the manor, mistaking the American soldiers who remained as Germans. They finally saw the waving of a Red Cross flag and held their fire. Lieutenant Robert Keith and his partner Jerry Searle returned to All Flag 64 several days later to find a desolate camp. The Russians had arrived just a day after the march began and transported the remaining Americans to Rimbertov near Warsaw. I found one package of, uh, it was a Red Cross box, it was used to box up stuff, and in it was this 35 millimeter GI camera, some film, and so I, that's what I used to be camera in the film, not knowing how to work either to take uh, the pictures of the, of the camp. Like Keith and his partner, each group of Americans who left the March Column would begin their own journey towards ultimate freedom. With the aid of Polish and Russian families, as well as Russian troops, the men found their way to Odessa over the next month. From there, ships would take them on their road towards home. They could only wonder what happened to their fellow soldiers who had continued the march in Poland's dead of winter. The column of American POWs 47 kilometers from Chubin. The weary soldiers piled into the barns in this small village for needed rest. We were put up in uh, a farm and I was put in with the cows and the only place was in the gutter in the center there to sleep. The cow on that side and the cow on that side, except that cow on that side started having a calf. And I ended up helping deliver the calf in there. I guess that's why I went on into veterinary school later. Early in the morning, somebody came and woke me up and says, don't make a move and don't make a sound. The Germans have gone. And uh, they're down the road there how many miles, we don't know. And the Russians are down the road the other way, we don't know how many miles. The American officers were free, the first time since their capture. The German guards, including Oberst Schneider, had deserted the group during the night. The number, still some 1,000, scurried through the village looking for food from the Poles. Around noon, however, Hauptmann Zimmermann, the off-lag 64 German security officer, returned with several Latvian SS troops. The orders were to form the column and march. That day, this Polish farmer got a big hog and he hung it up out in his barnyard and we was going to uh, butcher it and eat it. Well, the Germans came in and we didn't have time to do anything. But I had a knife, you know, like you eat at the table with, you put butter on you. And I walked over to that hog and I started trying to cut me a, 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 a hind quarter off that <laughs> with that knife and it was so dull, I didn't, I, it's just nothing, I couldn't cut anything. But one guy had a good sharp knife and he cut a big chunk of that meat off that hog. And for all oh, the next week or so, you could smell like pork chops and bacon, you know, he'd be up at the front of the column somewhere cooking that stuff. While many had already set out on their own, the majority reluctantly packed up. Their short-lived freedom was over. We were really depressed uh, because we wondered if we had made the right choice by staying with the column. And uh, we were, we were exhausted, and a lot of people were running out of food. And we came into this town that I remember as Lobson. Suddenly, somebody started trading food, and the crowd just went wild. The, uh, our Kriegers were going to uh, into houses and knocking on doors, and the Germans were 
the guards were screaming at us, trying to control us. And uh, one fellow who was in my platoon, he happened to challenge this old gentleman who had two loaves of bread under his arm, big loaves of bread. And we were all trying to trade with this fellow, naturally. And the old fellow didn't want cigarettes and didn't want soap, and he kept pointing to his pants, to the soldier's pants. And so this fellow, and he was from Texas, snatched off his pants and hobbled on one foot, and getting his pants off. And it was very cold, extremely cold. And he gave the fellow the pants for the two loaves of bread. And we all felt stupid because we hadn't thought of that. I was wearing two pair of pants. This fellow didn't have anything. He was in his long drawers, and as cold as it was. And in 30 seconds' time, he had swapped some other creaky, a half a loaf of bread for uh, one pair of pants, and a half a loaf of bread for another pair of pants. He wound up with one loaf of bread and two pair of pants. And it was all done while he was hopping down the street. From Lobeson, they moved out, filed into another set of barns for overnight. Waiting for them was Oberst Schneider and his guards, who had disappeared several days earlier. Schneider lectured the Americans on not acting like officers, resulting in his having to go find the SS troops. The following morning, orders were to shoot in all haystacks to ensure no more escapes. As men came out of haystacks, they stood under guard as shots sprayed. The sergeant, the Feldwebel is arguing with Captain Menon that these are not POWs anymore. They're behind the line guerrillas and we're gonna kill them. We're gonna shoot them right now. And I, from the decibel of the conversation, I figured we've had it. This, this fellow is shouting a lot louder than the captain is talking. I could see myself in a pool of blood in that snow. But fortunately, the mouse turned into a lion. And he just insisted that the Oberst had given him orders to bring these POWs back to the main column. And that's what he was going to do. And finally, the sergeant backed down. But that's a pretty close call. And so we rejoined the, the column. The cold days and nights passed. The march continued. The route would take the American prisoners of war northwest toward the Baltic, the Russians still behind them, pushing towards Berlin. At this one place, there were some hens running around loose in the, in the barn area. And uh, we, uh, several of us just kind of followed the hen, you know, and said, sooner or later that hen's got to lay an egg. So uh, we said, that would be mighty fine. So we followed around. The other guys, one at a time, got tired of following the hen. And I was the last one with the hen. And finally, she went in the corner and laid an egg. And I got the egg. <coughs> and I ate that egg, woo, raw. And in about two hours, I was so sick I could. <laughs> so it all came back up. Their hopes of Russians' liberation began to fade as they trekked further into the German lines. Destination and fate uncertain. Once the column was up and about, Colonel John Mortars would uh, get up in the old cavalry fashion, and that's the way the cavalry started off when they were horse drawn, uh, is forward, ho! My feet froze. I got had feet frozen feet once and got onto the wagon that they put people on for a day, thinking that I couldn't go any further. Got to where I could barely hobble alone. He'd take my pack for a while, and then he got uh, in rather bad shape, and I hold his pack for a while. I remember one, one evening, we got into this barn, and I was about to freeze to death. And uh, I lay down, put my overcoat over me, and uh, I had two buddies, Griffin and Reed. We'd been buddies back in the camp, buddies there. And I, I think, I think I probably frozen to death. They, they, 
uh, got their coats and got under there with me. And we got warmed up and got through it and all right. And that was that was the worst time, I, worst part, about the worst part I had on it. We were marching along, struggling. The column had strung out a long way. Uh, and there was a dead Russian on the side of the road as we went by. And one of the guys, don't know his name, don't want to or anything, went over and went through his pockets and found a, a half a loaf of bread. And he, he took it from him and ate it along the march. This was, to me, kind of sad. I don't, I don't think I could have done it. But that man craving for food and everybody on the verge of starvation, he could not let a crumb of food to buy. February 12th, the column of American POWs crossed the Oder River. The Latvian SS troops guarding were left behind, and the remaining German guards breathed a sigh of relief, with now a water barrier between them and the Russians. On March 6th, 45 days later and over 360 miles from Schuben, Poland, the exhausted and hungry American officers arrived on foot to Parchim, Germany. The numbers had dropped considerably, many escaping along the route. Hundreds who were too sick to march on were trained to camps, including Luchenwald, Germany. In Parchim, the estimated 450 remaining officers, including Colonel Popgood and Lieutenant Colonel John Waters, boarded boxcars en route to Auflag 13B, Hamelburg, Germany. We were down to rock bottom. I, I was so hungry, not realizing it, that I couldn't walk down steps without holding, because I couldn't judge height, and that is one, one form of starvation. But there were two lieutenants sitting on the steps worrying about the fact that the people in their West Point class were going to get promoted, and they weren't going to. And I took one look at my said, son, you got a lot more things to worry about now than that. When you get out of here and the war is over, you worry, but don't worry about it. Now, they were from the 106th Division or one of those, but I mean, uh, they, they, had, uh, they hadn't shaved. They had, we walked in, we'd been on the road, we came in, we looked like we'd just taken a shower, you know, and I mean, it just, uh, you learn to live when you've been there that long. Good assumed command as senior American officer, General Patton's son-in-law, the executive officer. Towards the end of the March, one of General Patton's most controversial decisions would be made and some argue his worst. March 26th, Patton sent one armored company and one armored infantry, a task force of 300 men, under the command of Captain Abe Baum, 50 miles into the German lines. Their mission, to liberate the POWs at Hamelburg, including Patton's son-in-law. After about two hours of this, this sound of, of, of attacking forces, uh, suddenly had, had two shells, as I recall, that fired into the barracks, up very near the barracks, and uh, we could hear the tanks and hear the return fire of the, of the uh, guards and people near the camp. I looked out the window and I saw these tanks and men coming up over the hill and the Germans were firing from the other side and I says, get under the bed, get under the bed, and that's what I did, and I missed most of it, but I figured this. I was going to be a dead, a live coward rather than a dead hero. As they approached the gates, they began shooting at the Serbian barracks, mistaking them as German. Upon the German commandant's surrender, Waters, with an American flag and white surrender cloth, walked through the gates, accompanied by two American officers and a German captain. A German soldier shot Waters in his left buttock. His response to the soldier? You son of a bitch, you just ruined my fishing. Seriously wounded, he was taken to the American Yugoslav hospital in camp. A Serbian doctor kept Waters alive by draining his wound. Captain Baum was uh, absolutely uh, confounded by the fact he thought 
he might be bringing back 300 POWs, he found that there were somewhere in the order of a thousand or more. I was in a formation, and as soon as they told us that, I started running, and I think I was probably the first person to reach the tanks. I, I uh, wasn't gonna miss a ride back. My common sense said, uh, this'll never make it, because uh, although they've come in 60 miles, uh, the Germans undoubtedly have bottled up all the escape routes by this time, and we'll never make it. But uh, we were fed up with being POWs, and we thought we'd take the gamble. What Juskalian feared became reality several hours later. The task force, on its route back to American lines, was destroyed. Captain Baum, his men, and the American POWs were either injured, recaptured, or killed in the fighting. With the Germans retaking off flag 13B, they moved all American POWs by foot and train to Nuremberg and Mooseburg. Remaining at Hamelburg were the Serb POWs and the injured Americans, including Baum and Waters. A week later, the 14th Armored Division liberated the camp. Several days later, Patton visited his son-in-law in a Frankfurt hospital to award him with two silver stars. When Waters asked, did you know I was there? Patton denied knowing for sure. Strong evidence exists, though, that he at least had a good idea, enough of one to make a decision that would jeopardize the lives of the ill-equipped task force, not to mention his own son-in-law, in an operation he considered to be the only error in his European campaign. Russian forces arrived at Stalag 3B in Luchenwald on April 22, 1945. Many Americans at this camp, including the men from off Lag 64, weren't sure if the Russians' intentions were to set them free. Some, therefore, escaped the compound. On May 6th, however, the camp was turned over to the Americans. On April 29th, General Patton's Third Army liberated over 130,000 Allied POWs at Stalag 7A Mooseburg including the off-lag 64 American officers who had arrived from Hamelburg earlier that month. American POWs would soon be transported to Camp Lucky Strike, a POW processing center in Le Havre, France. From there, they finally headed home. As the late Vic Canners typed his memories upon his return to the States, he remembers the march and the words he began praying each night he lay down for sleep. I give thanks today for the greatest gift that man can know, to be an American and live in America. This was a, a period of, of history and a period of, of, of American, Americanism, which uh, no longer exists to some extent. To a great extent. When I see people, and the flag goes by, just ignore it, talk. After being through this experience, I know how much cold a, a human being can take. And after being starved, I know how hungry you can get. I learned so much about dealing with people. I learned so much about hardships. It's taught me today that on average American day life, it, this is a snap compared to what I had to put up with then. I, I would like to make, make some profound statement, but I can't. But the one thing that did come out of that is that how important it is to survive. And uh, you just don't let anybody get you down. You don't, uh, you just keep forging ahead. And we, there was just never any doubt that we were gonna get out of that camp. It was an experience that I would not exchange for $5 billion tax-free. But at the same time, I will not go through it again for $50 billion tax-free. I don't think that it hurt a bit. I think I'm better off from it. And I didn't have anything when I went in, and I didn't have anything when I went out, and don't have much now. But we're living and enjoying it. It was a, a time that you cared about people. And I think that impression has lasted uh, ever since. Uh, we had gone 72 hours without any food or water, 
and I was able to trade some $2 bills for some vino and some rice. So I make it a practice at all times to carry $2 bills with me because I figure that's my lucky charm. It was something that I would wish on anybody else, but I'm so, I'm kind of proud of what, of, of what happened. I really am, that I'm, I, uh, it's nice to be part of Tom Brokaw's greatest generation. There's a certain prideful feel, feel, feeling for it. I think that's perfectly pride. You know, pride goes before a fall, but uh, I, am, I am proud that I was part of this thing and got something out of it, made a contribution.